Morning, ladies and gentlemen. March 14th, Pi Day. Uh, we're going to spend some time today talking about totalitarianism. So two videos, one of the left and one of the right, so that we can clearly distinguish between the two of those things. Looking down at our study guide, ladies and gentlemen, we are on our fifth page. Okay, uh, As a general overarching theme, totalitarianism or authoritarian governments rose in the 1920s and 30s to answer the problems that other countries were having during the Depression and the troubled time of the 20s. Totalitarianism is a form of government that seeks to control all of the aspects of an individual's daily life. Now, we're kind of hearkening back to the earlier period in our study when we talked about absolute monarchies, where absolute monarchies, or absolute monarchs, I should say, tried to take over all of the aspects of a society and of the nation. Now, the difference here is that totalitarian governments are going to be way more effective. Part of that is because the bureaucracies, the governments are bigger and they are stronger than they were two, three hundred years ago. And on top of that, technology is going to play an important role now. It's as powerful as Louis XIV might have been, but you did not see him in your living room uh, in the newspaper. You didn't hear him in your living room on the radio. Hitler and Mussolini are both going to be able to make that appeal and make it appeal uh, to so many people because it becomes a personal message, and that totalitarian push becomes more powerful. Now, we're asked about the difference between the right and the left. We talked about the fact that totalitarianism, when we talk about the left and the right, is very similar when it comes to tactics, but there's one central core difference, and this is the big one. If you miss this, you've missed the whole boat. Totalitarianism of the right believes in a more capitalist-centered government. Individuals continue to own the resources of production. For instance, a factory, uh, a farmer's field, a business. You can hold on to those in the right system. Now, both Mussolini and Hitler might ask you to do something with that that helps the state. For instance, I notice you have a field. Well, we need potatoes. You're going to grow potatoes, and those potatoes are going to be fed to our people of the army. You'll still get paid for this, but you're going to grow potatoes. You can't say, oh, no, I want to grow turnips. No, we don't need turnips. We need potatoes. Now, totalitarianism of the left, on the other hand, focuses more on a socialist structure, meaning that the government takes over the resources of production in the society and uses those in order to try and give all of the people of the society an equal life. That's always a troubled thing because giving everyone equality is hard to do. In a socialist society, though, there would be no private ownership. Uh, that field I was just talking about, that is no longer your potato field. It belongs to the people of the USSR. You might still be able to work on it, but the benefits of it, whether that be the food or the sale of the food, that is going to go to the greater good of the Soviet Union. It's not yours. So the big difference between the right and the left is really going to boil down to economics. And those economics are hugely different, as we'll see here in a moment. Let's start talking today uh, about the Italians, then we'll move on to the Germans. A lot of people talk about Hitler, 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 Hitler. Hitler is going to take a lot of leads from Mussolini. Mussolini rises to power in 1923 in Italy. Hitler's not going to get there in Germany until 1933. So some of the playbook, if you will, of the fascists in Italy becomes the way Hitler runs his run to power. Why were many Italians upset about the Treaty of Versailles? Remember that the Italians had stayed out of the war initially because they didn't feel like they had to honor the alliance with Germany and Austria-Hungary. When they did get into the war, they got in on the Allied side, helping out the British and the French, and later on the United States. The Italians are really in the war because they believe they're going to get portions of the Austro-Hungarian Empire when it breaks up after World War I. They want to expand. If you think of right at the top of the Italian boot, where the boot stops looking like this and kind of goes bloop, like that, they want some of that territory from Austria-Hungary to expand the Italian influence in that area. And that's what they're promised. But they don't get it. When they get to Versailles, the notion of nationalism, of self-determination of peoples, overrules that Italian claim. Now, the Italians feel like, we gave you half a million soldiers. We spent a huge amount of money on a war that gave us some land, but not all the land we wanted? Nah, nah. That's what they said. I don't know what that means, literally. But it's not good. You're sending back the garlic bread. Nah. Okay. Uh, what factors helped Mussolini take control of society? Some of the things that we should keep in mind here. Number one, 
After World War I, the governments in Italy, not very efficient. A lot of Western-style coalition governments where democratic powers uh, tried to work together in order to rule the country didn't work. The Italians suffered huge strikes after the war. As the wartime production went down, the number of workers went down, and the workers were upset about the conditions and also the pay that they were getting. The rise of the Soviet Union is the big one, though. Oh, socialism is out there. And the Italians are now going to be afraid of socialism. So when we start to look at the people that uh, Mussolini really attracts as being his first group of individuals, go out and find people for whom socialism is the boogeyman. Industrialists, landowners, middle class people, uh, soldiers, people who believe in a capitalist traditional structure of government. Don't go and recruit the poorest classes because those people want socialism, or at least socialism would help them more. Go find people for whom socialism is the ultimate end of their existence, and that's the people you motivate. So the early followers of the fascist movement for Benito Mussolini are going to be people who would be afraid of that socialism or are upset about the Treaty of Versailles. Let's talk about that word fascist for a moment. We use it today like, oh my God. He wouldn't give me a cappuccino. What a fascist. A fascist is kind of a right-wing totalitarian leader, someone who takes complete control of the situation. Like, that lunch lady, she's a fascist. That'd be a good use of the term, okay? Now, a fascist is anyone over on that right wing. So we're going to talk about the Nazis in a moment. A Nazi is also a fascist. But Nazism brings with it things that fascism doesn't bring with it. Talk about that more in a moment. Moving along, though, let's go to that back chart. And kind of clipping down the list here uh, to try and get to Hitler as well in this video. Uh, Mussolini, once he is allowed to march into Rome, is seen as being the leader of the Italian people, uh, and he expands that power over time. Now, important things. He marches into Rome. Let's put a couple things straight. Number one, he is already in power when he marches into Rome. The black shirts who march into Rome are doing so as an ornamental gesture, if you will. That's something Hitler doesn't really understand. We'll talk about that in a moment. Okay? Mussolini's men are already in control, but he wants the show of force. He likes the bravado of it. Okay? Once they get into power, uh, the fascists put through what's called the Acerbo Law. And the Acerbo Law says that any party that gets 25% or more in the next election gets two-thirds of the seats in the Italian legislature. Boom. You get 25%, you've got two-thirds. You need two-thirds to pass laws. Once the fascists manage to hook up that 25%, and they get that easily, then they've got two-thirds of the seat. Done. Game. Now we ban all the other political parties, and everything else we need to do takes place. Use of force against a common enemy. Socialists. Mussolini is going to crack some skulls, and he's not going to be apologetic about it. We crack skulls because socialists are dangerous, he'll tell you. And we go after those people. He brags about the fact that they have socialists killed, that the black shirts go out and thug it up on other socialists. Control of the economy for the good of the state. Mussolini has a system called corporatism. Corporatism is designed to try and assure that the entire economy works for the good of the state. Again, it's a private-style economy. It's capitalist. People still own the field, the factory, uh, the business. But the economy has to be driven in order to serve the good of the state. And a lot of that's going to be militaristic. We are building here a new Roman Empire. The age of empire shall return to Italy. We will dominate the Mediterranean like the Roman lake that it once was. Viva Italia! Il Duce! He did a lot of that. He had a huge chin, Mussolini. Look at down here. Big chin. Big chin. That's what it looked like. It's huge. It's like, where'd you get that thing? It's like Beverly Hills plastic surgery. Move on, Holiday. I will. Okay, emphasize the role of women in the family. That's something that's going to be absolutely the same across the board here. Women make babies. Men get married and help women make babies. But women stay home and work in the home. Do not leave the home and try and be something else. Okay, I, I talked about the fact that if you had 14 children, you could meet Mussolini, right? 14 babies, a chance to meet Mussolini. I know, ladies, tempting, tempting, okay? If you were a man, there were higher taxes. If you were a bachelor, uh, to encourage people to have families, we're building this new society. We need people to start having young fascists. Uh, Mussolini had a group called the Order of the Wolf 
for young men, where he said that every good Italian schoolboy had a book and a musket with him at all times. Nice. Great. I think we're going to end this video and we're going to have a whole new one on the Nazis. Have a nice day, folks.